customer service, right? I, I run into it a lot, the customer service, because I handle in my house all the hookups, internet, whatever we need, gas. I do all that. I got on the phone with the cable people, right? I don't know if you ever try hook up cable over the phone with these people. There's a pre-recorded message that says, we're going to monitor the call for quality assurance, right? So as soon as I get a live operator, I tell them, just so you know, I'm recording a call on my end too, okay? <laughs> you got me, I got you. Behave. Behave. So the next morning, I come down for breakfast. I got a guy in my yard already. Cable guy's in the yard already. My wife is like, what is he doing? I go, I don't know. Now, I handle that. That's another thing you handle as a husband. You got a guy in your yard, you take care of that. You don't send your wife, oh, what's he? Go out there. As a husband, you have to handle stuff. You make reservations to a restaurant. As the man, you check in. You go right up to, the, I got a two man of skunk up tonight. You got that? You don't send your wife. I see it all the time. Wives go up. Hi, we're here. Two for uh, Johnson. It's ready. Honey, you want to? It's ready, honey. You want to come up here? <laughs> handle it. So I handle the cable guy. I come outside in the yard. Go, What's going on? What are you doing? So how'd you get back here? <laughs> I can't do it. I gotta take a break. Break? He didn't do nothing. <laughs> He's telling me he can't hook the cable up because the cable's in my neighbor's yard. I gotta ask my neighbor if it's okay for him to go get the cable. I go, Julio, you broke into my yard. <laughs> can't you just break into his? It's your cable. Go get the damn thing. I can do it. <laughs> so me and Julio go over to my neighbor. I just moved into the neighborhood. I don't even know the guy. I knock on the door. The guy came to the door, had a full medical mask on. <laughs> if you have a medical mask on and you answer the door, that's got to be the first thing out of your mouth, okay? Why you got this damn thing on? <laughs> I come to my door with a medical mask. I take it down. Listen, doing some painting in the, in the garage. Gets into my lungs. That's why I got the mask. <laughs> this guy, nothing on the mask. Started talking through the mask. He's like, what's going on? I go, no, no, no. What's going on in here? <laughs> I just bought the joint next door. Do I got to put it up for sale? Why the hell do you got a medical mask on? on a Monday morning, okay? Let's get into that. I'm going to send Julio in your yard. Is he going to come out with no head? What are you doing with the mask? I live in the negative. Live in the negative. My wife is in the positive, okay? Came back to, to our house. I said, put the for sale sign up. There's a guy with a medical mask living next door. Good morning. It is Thursday, May the 25th, and this is The True Conservative. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today, after the Serenity Prayer and the Star Spangled Banner, we will have Stuart Varney, No Free Lunch, The Rape of the Mind, and Sean Hannity versus Robert Reich. You decide. All that and more when I get back. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. 
Amen. Thank you, thank you. And now, There's No Free Lunch, 250 Economic Truths by David Bonson. Under a system of perfectly free commerce, each country naturally devotes its capital and labor to such employments as are most beneficial to each. This pursuit of individual advantage is admirably connected with the universal good of the whole. By stimulating industry, by rewarding ingenuity, and by using most efficaciously the peculiar powers bestowed by nature, it distributes labor most effectively and most economically, while by increasing the general mass of productions, it diffuses general benefit and binds together by one common tie of interest and intercourse, the universal society of nations throughout the civilized world. David Ricardo. This concept is, of course, at the heart of free trade as well. The diversity of talent that exists in a free society is expanded upon when we consider global taste, experience, skill, and ingenuity. Harnessing the division of labor across countries has allowed the free enterprise system leverage in spreading its rewards. There are, of course, critics of the idea that a division of labor across the global landscape is good for domestic interest. Questions of shared cultural values are raised that are not easily answered by market mechanisms. It is here that a simple but mysteriously ignored appeal to the free and virtuous society is paramount. That free exchange or harnessing the division of labor would force a business to transact with evil actors is absurd. A failure of conscience is not a failure of a market economy. It's a failure of a bad actor created with agency. And that was There's No Free Lunch by David Bonson. Thank you, thank you. Who is the true conservative? He is the person that understands that conservatism is not just about politics, but culture as well. He is not selfish, but minds his own business. He acts like an adult. He is patriotic and uses common sense. He expresses what he knows and does so with absolute certainty. He makes judgments, refuses to speculate, speaks clearly and definitively, and is not afraid to say no. He's open-minded asking why rather than why not. He is consistent, credible, and influential, not ashamed of his existence, unafraid to learn or correct his mistakes. He's a normal American, and he is better than the socialist. He's a better friend, father, brother, family member, and a better person, period. You have to know that. If you don't know with every fiber of your being that being a true conservative is best, then you're wasting your time. Back in a minute. (laughs) 
Thank you, thank you. What are the true conservative suggested political priorities? Number one, the abolition of abortion throughout the land. Number two, make nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons obsolete. Number three, immediate decertification of all public employee unions. Four, the immediate assignment of criminal and civil liabilities to all government regulators. Number five, the immediate repeal of the so-called Patriot Act. Number six, the immediate repeal of all emergency dictator laws. Number seven, the reinstatement of writs of outlawry. Eight, government-sponsored recalls, ballot initiatives, and referendums. Nine, a flexible minimum wage. Ten, means-tested health care. Eleven, the immediate and permanent prohibition of investment banking by any office holder. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. What are the true conservative cultural priorities? Bring back hierarchy. Bring back the admiration of intelligence, morality, and beauty. Bring back single-income households, integration, parenting, the primacy of existence, certainty of knowledge, and universal rights and wrongs. Bring back principled behavior, masculinity, and femininity. Bring back Adam 12, John F. Kennedy, the gold standard, pre-HMO medical care, and non-profit news. Bring back civil service, the term stupid question, arguments and fights, the cultural influence of the church and the Boy Scouts. Bring back the influence of social organizations such as the Lions Club and the Rotary Club. Bring back bowling. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. So now, Stuart Varney, uh, about a uh, congresswoman who wants, uh, who's making an interesting statement. Progressive Congresswoman Pramila Jaipal claims Republicans want the nation to default. Roll tape. I think there are many in the Republican Party, unfortunately, that want to crash the economy, that want to send this country into chaos and catastrophe, and think that maybe it will help their election prospects in 2024 if the country is in chaos. So uh, he was wrong when he said that, uh, again, you got to listen carefully, listen carefully to what the, the left says, because it's very, very important. They want to get credit for saying things they don't actually say. They want to create chaos, but be able to say, don't look at me, I didn't start it. Okay, so he says, oh, this woman is blaming Republicans or saying Republicans want to crash. When you listen to what she actually said, she says, I think there are many Republicans. She qualifies that statement. This way, if somebody comes out and says, uh, like Stuart Varney, oh, you claim Republicans, blah, blah, she'll say, no, I didn't. She has plausible, what is known as plausible deniability. She gets to have her cake and eat it too. Now, that's also a weakness, but that's for another time. The point is that you've got to listen carefully. Now, the other thing is what they're talking about here when she says exploding. Why are they so intent on describing uh, a debt ceiling, if we can't get an agreement on the debt ceiling, as some kind of a catastrophe? Simple. Because for the Democrat Party, it will be a catastrophe. Republicans 20 years ago, uh, 40 years ago, as a matter of fact, and have been doing it ever since, have been making a prediction that if we keep borrowing money, eventually we're going to have to pay the piper. We're going to have fewer, m- less money for discretionary spending, less money for um, entitlement spending, and we may even have to start printing money in order to pay the interest on the debt. But it never happens. Why hasn't it ever happened? Because the Democrats have found a way to hide the consequences, to hide things so that we don't have to make those kinds of choices, so we don't have $12 loaves of bread, and that is the debt ceiling. By simply raising, continue to raise and raise and raise the debt ceiling, they can put off, they, and they think indefinitely, the consequences of their actions. Republicans need to be firm on the debt ceiling. They should not raise it 
They've already done so, and shame on them for doing it. But they shouldn't. They should go out to the American people and say, it is time for the Democrats to pay for their mistakes. We all complain about how come everybody, nobody seems to be held accountable. This is the time to punish the Democrats for the mistakes of overspending and overborrowing. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And now, the rape of the mind. Stages of thinking and illusion. Here I follow in part the classification of S. Ferenczi and that of my own book on delusion. The psyche is constantly confronted with and communicating with the outside world. And at every phase of an individual's development, that world and its events are experienced differently. Although different scientists have drawn different conclusions about the various phases and their implications, the very recognition of change and growth of personal outlook is one of the most important scientific findings in psychology and is agreed on by all psychologists. Let me briefly explain here the developmental approach to human psychology. It is not the only one, but it will serve to illustrate the tremendous impact of immature and delusional thinking on our final opinions. Developmental psychology, as studied in children and primitives, posits at the origin of thinking in both the individual and the race, a hallucinatory stage of the mind in which there is no experience or difference between the inside and the outside world. The mental separation and distantation between the self and the world has not yet taken place. The psyche is felt to be omnipotent. All that is experienced inside the self is attributed to the universe as well and is imagined to be part of that universe. According to developmental psychology, the infant experiences the world in this way, and in certain types of insanity, the adult will revert to this hallucinatory stage. Yet, even mature man does not succeed completely in separating internal fantasy from outside reality. And often he thinks that his private and subjective moods are caused by some external actuality. In the next stage, that of animistic thinking, there is still a partial sense of oneness between the ego and the world. The individual's inner experience, his fears, his feelings are projected onto seeming causative agents in the outside world. The outside world is a continual demonic thread to him. The child who bumps against the table projects onto that table a hostile living power and hits back. The primitive tribesman hunted by beasts of prey attributes to the animal he feared a divine power, that of a hostile god. The entire outside world may, in fact, be peopled with the fears of men. In times of panic and fear, we may all populate our neighborhood with non-existent traitors or fifth columnists. Our animistic thinking is continually busy accusing others of what actually occurs inside our own minds. Nowadays, there are no devils and ghosts in trees and in wild animals. They have made their homes in the various scapegoats created by dictators and demagogues. The third stage is that of magical thinking in which there is still a sense of intimate connection between man and his outside world. However, man places himself more in opposition to the world than in union with it. He wants to negotiate with the mysterious powers around him. Magic is, in fact, the simplest strategy of man. He has discovered that he can manipulate the world with signs and gestures or sometimes with real actions or changes. He erects totem poles and sacrificial blocks. He makes talismans and strange medicines. He uses words as powerful signs to change the world. He develops a ritual to satisfy his need for coming to terms with the outside world. Which of us has not felt a sudden desire to count cobblestones or is not the jealous possessor of an amulet or some other secret token whose power would be lost if his existence were known to the others. Immature as they are, these tokens serve to build up happiness and a good life. We all still live in the world of magic and are caught in the delusion of happy manipulation of nature. The modern tribe drives around in mechanized cars and becomes a megalomaniac sorcerer of the wheel. Millions of victims are brought to the altar of the god's speed because our hidden delusion that frenzied rapidity prolongs life. The engine and the gadget have replaced the more mysterious amulet of earlier days. Knowledge is still the service of power instead of in the service of understanding. In the last phase of mental development, man makes a complete separation between himself and the outside world. He not only lives with things and tries to manipulate them, but he also lives in opposition to them. 
In this phase of mature reality confrontation, man becomes an observer of his own life. He recognizes the abyss of his own being. He sees his body and mind as separate from the world. With hands, ears, eyes, and his controlling mind, he confronts reality. He steps back from the world and observes it. He is, in fact, the only animal that walks erect, straightforwardly facing the world. He is the only animal that uses his hands and his senses as verifying instruments. Gradually, his own mind-body becomes an instrument whose drives he may accept or reject. Only man is able to see his drives and instincts as either dangerous or useful. Man not only knows an externally imposed fear, but he knows an inner fear. Fear of losing the inner controls he has acquired at so high a price. With arms and hands, man reaches out, not only toward the outside world, which he once hoped to conquer with magic gestures as a baby does, but he also knowingly reaches out toward an inside world. Mature man lives between an inner and an outer world. There is something tragic about this laborious process of becoming conscious of a separate inner and outer reality. In becoming mature, man awakens from a sweet primitive dream in which he was part of an individual whole, part of a nirvanic world of equanimity. The sense of lost unity with the universe lingers on, and in moments of mass tension, or in times of crisis, he reaches toward that ancient experience of impersonal, irresponsible bliss. Utter passivity or self-destruction, artificial ecstasy obtained by means of drugs, the suicidal wish for eternal sleep, All are devices by which man hopes to fulfill that eternal yearning. At what stage in connection with these developments of human experience may we speak of delusion? When the member of a primitive tribe placates the mysterious and hostile world by prayer to his totem animal, we do not call this delusion. But a man who has attained to a more advanced stage of thinking relapses into such primitive habit of thought, then it is possible to call this falling back retrogression a delusion. And that was Stages of Thinking and Delusion from the Rape of the Mind by Juiced Mirlo, M.D. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And so now for this episode of You Decide, it's going to be Robert Reich versus... Sean Hannity. Robert Reich was a former labor secretary in the Clinton administration. And uh, so anyways, this is going to be there. He wrote a book called The System. Sean Hannity wrote a book called Live Free or Die. And so I'm going to play a sample of each book and let you decide. So we're going to start with Robert Reich from his book, The System. For people like him. I believe he does. Let me explain. Millions of Americans, whether on the left or the right of the political spectrum, know something has gone profoundly wrong. Quote, right now we have a system that favors those who can pay for access and outcomes. That's how you explain an economy that's rigged to corporations and to the very wealthiest said Beto O'Rourke at the first Democratic presidential candidate's debate in 2019. When you've got a government, when you've got an economy that does great for those with money and isn't doing great for everyone else, that is corruption pure and simple, said Senator Elizabeth Warren at the same forum. Big business, elite media, and major donors are lining up behind the campaign of my opponent because they know she will keep our rigged system in place said Donald Trump in his acceptance speech at the Republican convention in 2016. If solutions within the system are so impossible to find, then maybe we should change the system itself, said 16-year-old climate activist Greta Thunberg. As New York Magazine's Frank Rich put it, everything in the country is broken. Not just Washington, which failed to prevent the financial catastrophe and has done little to protect us from the next, but also race relations, health care, education, institutional religion, law enforcement, the physical infrastructure, the news media, the bedrock virtues of civility and community. Nearly everything has turned to crap, it seems, except peak TV for those who can afford it. He might have added the environment and our democracy. 
The concentration of wealth in America has created an education system in which the super-rich can buy admission to college for their children, a political system in which they can buy Congress and the presidency, a health care system in which they can buy care that others can't, and a justice system in which they can buy their way out of jail. Almost everyone else has been hurled into a dystopia of bureaucratic arbitrariness, corporate indifference, and legal and financial sinkholes that have become the hallmarks of modern American life. This mammoth systemic dysfunction is generating a great deal of heat, anger, upset, frustration, and outrage. Heat in any system signals potential change, like tectonic plates that cause earthquakes and volcanoes as they crash into each other. Heat is a sign of underlying tumult. In today's America, the status quo is unsustainable. Subterranean tensions are building. If you want to understand where the system is now and what you might do to help move it in a more humane direction, you will need to look beneath its surface and reassess many of your assumptions. First, forget politics as you've come to see it, as electoral contests between Democrats and Republicans. Think power. The underlying contest is between a small minority who have gained power over the system and the vast majority who have little or none. Don't assume that a U.S. president or any other head of state unilaterally makes big decisions. Look at the people who enable and encourage those decisions and whose interests those decisions serve. Forget what you may have learned about the choice between the free market and government. A market cannot exist without a government to organize and enforce it. The important question is whom the market has been organized to serve. Forget the standard economic goals of higher growth and greater efficiency. The issue is who benefits from more growth and efficiency. Don't be dazzled by corporate social responsibility. Most of it is public relations. Corporations won't voluntarily sacrifice shareholder returns unless laws require them to do so. Even then, be skeptical of laws unless they're enforced and backed by big penalties. Large corporations and the super-rich ignore laws when the penalties for violating them are small relative to the gains for breaking them. Fines are then simply a very manageable cost of doing business. Don't assume that we're locked in a battle between capitalism and socialism. We already have socialism for the very rich. Most Americans are subject to harsh capitalism. Don't define national competitiveness. Okay, so that was Robert Reich from his book called The System, and now Sean Hannity from his... Republicans made with Democrats, it always resulted in bigger and expanding government. Now, temporary constraints on government, like welfare reform, were chipped away at over time, and the nation continued its long march towards socialism at an ever-quickening pace. We all watched it unfold. Now, even if unopposed, it's doubtful that conservatives would head in some radical direction by themselves. Now, radical conservatism, it's kind of a contradiction in terms. Conservatives, what do we favor? Smaller, less centralized, less intrusive government. They believe the federal government should be vigorous in those areas over which the Constitution grants its power like national defense. And like the framers, they believe the government must be powerful enough to protect Americans from domestic and foreign threats. But we respect constitutional restraints on government, including the balance of power, the doctrine of federalism, and the Bill of Rights. Now, they would never support shrinking the federal government beyond what the Constitution mandates. We all understand that our freedom is secured and preserved by maintaining a proper balance between the powers of government and the liberties of our citizenry. But liberty, that's our watchword. As a conservative, it's us. It's who we are. And liberty is what makes America unique. The left, by contrast, has all but abandoned liberty in favor of government-forced outcomes through their agenda guarantees. Not only less liberty, but less prosperity as well. 
While conservatism is inherently non-radical, progressivism, especially today's version of it, is instinctively radical. Now, left to their own devices, now they'd move the entire country wholesale right into socialism and authoritarianism. Americans, we cannot afford to let our guard down for one moment if we hope to pass down the blessings of liberty to our children. Our work in shoring up constitutionally guaranteed liberties, that's never going to be complete. We can never rest because the left, they never stop. They're never going to rest. It's who they are and it's who they will always be. So to save America, they've got to be defeated in the battle of ideas and they've got to be defeated at the ballot box. Just look how disconnected the Democrats' current program is from concerns and values of the American people. Does a majority of our fellow countrymen, do they want to elect self-proclaimed socialists to office? Do most Americans embrace radical environmentalism policies that would bankrupt the nation, eliminate the lifeblood of the economy, fossil fuels? Do they want a government-guaranteed universal basic income? Do they glorify late-term abortion, even post-birth abortion, like Governor Northam? Are Americans demanding open borders and the abolition of ICE and welfare benefits for illegal immigrants and the elimination of private health insurance? Now, if the last 15 or 20 years have shown us anything, it's that the left means business, and their business includes wiping away American exceptionalism and the unique ideas that have made this nation the freest, the most prosperous in history. Now, I can't overstate the left's intentions and the devastating consequences. Guess what? We're all going to face if, in fact, they gain control of the presidency in Congress in 2020. And I can't emphasize enough how concerned personally I am by the unmistakable trends that we see. And we can all see it pretty plainly. And how imperative it is that Donald Trump get reelected in 2020, along with a resounding Republican majority in both the House and in the Senate. You know why? Because our children's future depends on it. Chapter one, we begin a republic if you can keep it. I begin this book with a brief history of America's foundation. I start here. Because if we do not understand where we came from, how this country was designed, the principles that founded 200 years of success, guess what? We'll never be able to reestablish American greatness. This is crucial. Sometimes we Americans, we kind of take our freedoms for granted as though we've lost sight of our history and the sacrifices our ancestors made so that we could all live free. Have we forgotten what it means to be free? Have we taught our kids the importance of our founding principles? Have we shown them the direct connection between preserving our Constitution intact and maintaining liberties? Do our kids know and understand why the United States of America is strong and prosperous while many other nations are not? Have we sufficiently explained the miracles of a... So that was uh, Sean Hannity from his book called Live Free or Die. So now you have it. Robert Reich from the system versus Sean Hannity and Live Free or Die. You decide. This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States today, bidding adios to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. So I'm reminding you that 
The left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.